A man by the name of Masedu, who was inclined to the study of ornithology, cited to some friends a case so extraordinary that no one believed him. Some even came to believe he had lost his mind. Here now is a digest of the narrative. At the beginning of last month, he said, as I was walking down a street, a runaway carriage nearly knocked me to the ground. I escaped only by jumping into a junk shop. Neither the clamor of the horse and carriage nor my entrance roused the shopkeeper as he dozed in the background in a folding chair. He was a wreck of a man with a beard the color of dirty straw, his head crammed into a tattered cap which he was probably just unable to find a buyer for. It was impossible to guess what his story was at all, like some of the objects he sold, nor could you sense in him that austere sadness and disillusionment of a life really lived. The shop was dark, crammed with things, old, crooked, worn out, splotchy, rusty, what you'd usually find in such establishments, always in that state of half disorder, which is part and parcel of the business. This mishmash, banal as it was, was still interesting. Pans without lids, lids without pans, buttons, shoes, locks, a black skirt, fur and straw hats, wooden framing, binoculars, half coats, a fencer's foil, a stuffed dog, a pair of flip-flops, gloves, assorted vases, epaulettes, a velvet bag, two hangers, a slingshot, a thermometer, chairs, a, oh, a lithographed portrait by the late Cisson, a backgammon board, two wire-framed masks for the coming carnival. All this, and more that I didn't see, filled up the area of the shop's doorway, leaning hanging or displayed in glass cases equally dilapidated. Deeper inside, there were many more things all of the same appearance, large, dominating objects, dressers, chairs, beds, each on top of the other, lost in the darkness. It was in leaving that I saw a birdcage hanging by the door, as old as everything else. To fit in with the same appearance of general desolation, it needed only to be empty, only it wasn't empty. Inside, there hopped around a canary. The little bird's color, animation, and grace gave to that mound of refuse a little touch of life and youth. He was the last surviving passenger of some shipwreck and ended up there as whole and cheerful as he ever was. As soon as I looked at him, he hopped lower and higher up again from perch to perch, as if to say, in the middle of that cemetery, a ray of sunlight had come to play. Now, I don't attribute this metaphor to the canary unless I'm speaking to you all rhetorically. In truth, he was thinking of neither cemetery nor sun, according to what he told me later on. Me, all stirred up by the pleasure which brought me that vision, I felt indignant at the bird's fate and muttered under my breath some bitter words. Who could possibly have been the hateful owner of this tiny creature? Who had the nerve to be rid of him for a handful of nickels? Or what uncaring hand, not wanting to keep the deceased owner's dearest companion, gave it up for nothing to some kid who then sold it just to bet it all away on a one-two finish at the track? And the canary dropped down onto a perch and trilled in reply. Whoever you think you are, you are certainly out of your mind. I didn't have a hateful owner, nor was given to any boy who'd sell me. These are the imaginings of a sick person. Get thee to a cure, my friend. What? I interrupted, without having time to become amazed. Then your owner didn't sell you to this establishment? It wasn't misery or laziness that brought you into this cemetery like a ray of sunlight? I know not what sunlight is, nor cemetery. If the canaries that you have seen go by the first of those two names, so much the better, because it is lovely, but it is with them that you confuse me. Pardon me, but didn't you come here by chance without anyone, unless your owner was always that man sitting over there? What owner? That man there is my servant, who gives me water and food every day, and with such regularity that if I were required to pay for his services, it would be no small amount. But canaries don't pay servants, no, really. Canaries being owners of the world, it would be absurd for us to buy things in it. Astonished by his answers, I didn't know what to admire more, the language skills or the ideas. The language entering my ear as people speak had popped out of the little creature in funny trills. I looked all around me just to make sure I was awake. The street was the same. The shop was the same. Dark shop, sad and dank. 
The canary pacing from one side to the other was waiting for me to say something, so I asked him if he ever missed the blue and wide open sky. But my dear fellow, trilled the canary, what do you mean by blue and wide open sky? Pardon me, but what do you think of this world? What is the world? The world, countered the canary with a professorial certainty. The world is a junk shop with a little bamboo cage four-sided and hanging by a nail. The canary is lord of the cage he inhabits as well as the shop that surrounds it. Outside of that, everything is illusion and lies. With this, the old man awoke and shuffled over to me. He asked me if I wanted to buy the canary. I asked if he had acquired it like all the rest of the objects that he was selling, and yes, he knew all right that he'd bought it from a barber along with a razor collection. The razors are all in good condition, he concluded. I only want the canary. I paid the price he asked, and then I ordered the purchase of a voluminous, circular cage made of wood and wire painted white, and I arranged for them together to be delivered to the veranda of my house from which the little bird could see the garden, the fountain, and a little patch of blue sky. My objective was to conduct a long study of the phenomenon, saying nothing to anyone else until I could bedazzle the century with my extraordinary discovery. I started by alphabetizing the canary language, studying its structure, its relationship to music, the creature's aesthetic feelings, its ideas, its reminiscences. Having made this philological and psychological analysis, I made a formal study of canaries, of their origins, their early centuries, the geology and the flora of the Canary Islands, if he had any knowledge of navigation, etc. We conversed long hours, me writing notes, him waiting around, jumping, trilling. Having no one else in the household but two servants, I ordered them not to interrupt me unless for some urgent letter or telegram or visit of some importance. Both of them, knowing my scientific preoccupations, found everything perfectly natural and in order and never suspected that the canary and I understood each other. I don't have to tell you that I hardly slept. I woke two or three times every night, wandered aimlessly, felt feverish. Finally, I got back to work, reread, added, amended. I corrected more than one observation, either because I misunderstood it or because he had not expressed it clearly. His definition of the world was one of them. Three weeks after the canary entered my house, I asked him to repeat to me his definition of the world. The world is a rather large garden with a fountain in the middle. Flowers and shrubs, some grass, pure air, and a patch of blue overhead. The canary, lord of the world, inhabits a vast cage, white and round, from which he views the rest. Anything more is illusion and lies. The language of my paper also went through some adjustments, and certain conclusions that had seemed simple to me, I realized, were too bold. I couldn't yet write my report, which I had to send to the National Museum, the Historical Institute, and German universities. Not because there was a lack of material, but in order to accumulate all the observations and fact-check them. In those final days, I didn't leave the house, didn't receive letters, wanted no contact with family or friends. I was full-on canary. Every morning, one of the servant's duties was to clean the cage and give to him water and food. The little bird said nothing to him, as if he knew this man lacked sufficient scientific training. Not only that, his service was the most perfunctory in the world. The servant was not a bird lover. Well, one Saturday, I woke up sick. My head and spine ached. The doctor ordered absolute rest. This was due to my overstudying, and I shouldn't read or think. I shouldn't even be concerned with what was going on in the city and indeed the world. I remained five days like this. On Friday, I got out of bed, and only then did I learn that the canary, while the servant was taking care of him, fled the cage. My first impulse was to throttle the servant. Choking on my own indignation, I fell into my chair, speechless, dizzy. The culprit defended himself, swore that he was careful, but the bird had escaped by cunning. But you didn't search for him? Oh, yes, we searched, senor. At first he flew up to the roof. I climbed up too, but he flew away. He went into a tree. Then he hid I don't know where. I've been asking around since yesterday. I asked the neighbors, the orchard keepers, and nobody knows anything. Oh, I suffered terribly. Fortunately, my fatigue had passed by then, and after a few hours I was able to go out onto the veranda and into the garden. Not one shadow of the canary. 
I inquired. I ran around, called out, and nothing. I had already collected the notes to compose my paper, albeit truncated and incomplete, when I happened to visit a friend who occupies one of the most beautiful and largest orchards on the outskirts of town. We were walking around it before dinner when I heard the trill of a question. Greetings, Mr. Masetta. Where did you go that you disappeared? It was the canary. He was on the branch of a tree. Now imagine how I reacted based on what I've told you. My friend was concerned that I was crazy, but what did I care about friends? I spoke to the canary with affection. I pleaded with him to come back, to continue our conversation in that world of ours composed of a garden and fountain, a veranda and a white circular cage. What garden? What fountain? The, the world, my friend. What world? You never put aside this weakness of yours of professorializing. The world, he concluded solemnly, is a space infinite and blue with the sun above it. Indignant, I retorted. But if I understood you correctly, the world was everything. Why, up until recently, it was a junk shop. <laughs> junk shop? He warbled with unending hilarity. Are there really shops that sell junk? <laughs> Canary on the Brain by Machado de Assis, first published in 1899, translated from Portuguese for audio performance by Todd Connor, copyright 2020. This story was proud to feature Carlo Penz's brand new interpretation of one of the most beloved Brazilian songs ever, Chico Chico no Fubá, composed in 1917 by Zequinha de Abreu, well before there was Bossa Nova, and commissioned for the karaoke for this story. It was recorded in the 40s by Carmen Miranda, the Andrews sisters, and many, many others after that, including Charlie Parker and Paquita de Rivera, after whom we now come to Carlo Penza, who is an accomplished Brazilian jazz pianist, composer, and arranger, and has played with some of Brazil's biggest musical stars, including Daniela Mercury and Paulinho Cicantor from Novos Baianos. Mr. Penza has played extensively in Sao Paulo and Rio, but calls the state of Bahia his home. Contact him at the links and email provided in the description text. All rights to the recording in this podcast are retained by the artists who perform them. If you like this work and would like to support The Carrie please consider making a purchase at The Carrie Podcast Store. A direct link is available on the website at www.thecarrieorker.com. Or if you'd like to make a donation, click on the website's link for PayPal. Commercial or private sponsorship of future episodes can include the recording of a story live at your own location. See the website for details. In the meantime, as always, listen, like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. <laughs>